Hey, today I want to talk about my latest acquisition, this Thompson Center Firearms Renegade. This is a black powder muzzleloader replica of those commonly seen in the old frontier days, mainly associated with mountain men or other fur trappers. You're probably more than familiar with the 50 caliber Hawken from the 70's movie Jeremiah Johnson, right? Yeah, the one he found in Hatchet Jack's dead frozen hands. Well, this and other movies of the like kind of brought a renewed interest in these firearms and Thompson Center started pumping out replicas. Back in the frontier days when the Hawken brothers were hand making these one at a time by individual order, they called them the Rocky Mountain Rifle and the Renegade was most likely the more common look without all the flashy brass. You'll notice aside from the flashy patch box that I installed, the Renegade really has no flashy brass like in the movies. The most notable feature of any of these Hawkins is this double set trigger. This rear trigger is called the set trigger. It locks in the front firing trigger and makes it just like a hair pull. And this makes these an extremely accurate rifle up to a couple hundred yards. Of course with my tired old eyes I'll stick with 50 yards. Thompson Center Arms was eventually bought up by Smith & Wesson and I think somewhere around 2012 they, uh, they stopped making these replicas which is a shame uh, but I'm glad I got a hold of one. Um, I'll take it out and shoot it for you in the next episode but for this episode I want to show you how I went about installing this flashy patch box. So let's get to that. I ordered the patch box kit from Muzzle Loader Builder Supply in Aberdeen, Idaho, and they come totally unengraved, just plain stamped out brass. I didn't expect anything else, just thought I'd mention that for anyone thinking about installing one of these. It was formed to fit the stock, and, and I suppose one could install it as is, but it wouldn't really have that flashy look to it. So the first thing I did was figure out how to position it on the stock and I outlined that in pencil. Then I got to the engraving part. I figured my initials on the patch box lid would look pretty good. Probably not something you'd do if you were thinking of ever selling the piece, but I have no plans of doing that, so here we go. I picked out a font that I thought would look good, and because I don't own a fancy computer-aided engraving machine, I'm stuck with doing it the old-fashioned way. I printed my initials on this heavy duty sticky back paper and I'm going to use my small sandblaster to engrave it. Of course this means I need to painstakingly cut out this design by hand with an X-Acto knife. So here I am with one letter cut out and you'll notice that I opted to cheat a little bit. I'm afraid if I cut out these little tiny detail lines in the B here that the sandblaster is going to blow those small pieces of sticky back paper into oblivion. And there we go, all ready to sandblast. Notice I cut a freehand border around the outside so that would also get etched and I was considering some horizontal lines that I've penciled in but decided that if I really want those later I can use the hand engraver on those. Now for the sandblasting. I haven't used this tool in probably 20 years so I'm going to test it out first on an old aluminum pizza pan. I just stuck some of the same sticky back paper on it and cut out a quick design. The way this tool works, there's regular beach sand in this bag here, Oregon beach sand of course, and the compressor just blows it out the end, destroying anything in its path. And it looks like it's uh, pretty good. And now for the real thing. I'm going to utilize that pizza pan once more to set my work of art on it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
It actually turned out pretty good. I almost blew the D too much, but that buffed out with a clean cloth and it's ready to go. I pretty much did the same thing to the pineapple outside ring of the patch box, but I utilized my hand engraver a lot more and although far from a professional job, it came out okay, I think. Now it's time to carve out the stock. I was thinking I could use my Dremel with a router attachment, but with the COVID-19 pandemic in full swing, I couldn't find the right attachments anywhere. So I'm stuck using the full-size router with a small bit at first for the outer edges. Then I'll go to a bigger quarter-inch bit for carving out the actual box in the middle. And here's the finished box. There's two springs that come with the kit. One is back here installed on the lid plate and pushes the lid up so you can get your fingers on it and open it the rest of the way. The other spring is the latch which holds the lid down. The latch spring requires that you file a little bit of the outer ring and the lid so it has room to work and it also needs to sit on a higher ground than the bottom of the box which is dictated by the lid plate. So you need to router that depth in when making the notch for this latch. When we close the lid here, you can see what I mean about, you know, filing out the lid a little bit. Uh, not near as much as they have to file out the outer ring, but you gotta have room for that, that latch to work. And then of course, when you pull on the latch, the spring in the back pops the lid up just enough to get your finger under there and you pull it the rest of the way up. And see, you'll notice here um, how I mentioned that little pedestal that the latch spring's got to set on. It's got to be higher than, than the bottom of the trough, which is dictated by this lid plate back here. Well, and there you have it, one installed patch box on a 50 caliber Renegade. <clears throat> of course, I did some little detail afterwards with some, with some wood putty and whatnot, and stained it up and and uh, turned out pretty good for not being a professional job. Well and there you have it. So all installed and working properly and, uh, and don't forget to push that subscribe button. Talk to you later.